Hello, welcome to this video on Maxwell's uh, equations. Uh, we'll be solving um, uh, one, one full example in this video and uh, there are a couple of more examples in the, in the, in a, in a, in the other parts of this video. Um, and uh, the focus is to show you how to use Maxwell's equations. Uh, for, for most of the course, we focused on static problems where the charges were not changing with time. Um, static magneto magnetostatics problem where the currents were steady they were not changing with time and now we are going to introduce time variations in the fields and we'll see how the electric and magnetic fields are both now coupled together so when the electric field exists a magnetic field will also exist and when a magnetic field exists uh, an electric field will also exist so um, so now uh, we, we start uh, first by reviewing Maxwell's equations and then we move to have the example. Okay, so um, as we have seen in the lectures, the, all the electromagnetic phenomena are governed, or are governed by Maxwell's equation. These are Maxwell's equations in the differential form. These are Maxwell's equations in the integral form. Um, we need four quantities to express Maxwell's equations. E, D, B, and H, and we did explain these quantities during the course. Uh, when we had static charges, we talked only about E and D. When we had steady currents, currents that don't change with time, we talked only about B and H. And again, these two fields can exist in the, these two these two sets of fields can exist independent of one another in the static case. But once you have time varying case they become correlated, you become coupled. So here, if you have a magnetic field that is changing with time, this bar shall be partial T. So if this term is not zero, this will make the curl of E not, ze not zero. Curl of E it simply describes a change of E in space. So time variations of B gives rise to space variations of E. This is the second curl equation of Maxwell. You can see here, partial D partial T is really the rate of a change of the electric field because D is epsilon E. So if the electric field is changing with time, this term will not be zero. If this term is not zero, this means that the curl of H will not be zero, which means that the H will be changing in space. So time variations of the electric field give rise to space variations of the magnetic field. And of course, the other two law describes the relationship between the fields and the charges and of course we don't have anything called magnetic charges the same these same four laws can be written also in the integral form one of them is faraday's law and we did apply that in a number of examples to uh, calculate the induced emf we call this term here the emf induced emf uh, this law as well we did apply um, and again, this is a generalization of the of Ampere's law. Maxwell is the one who added this term. And these two ones here, these are Gauss' law for electrostatic fields and for magnetostatic fields. So these two are the same as these two, but they are the integral form. Okay, let's add the first question. Here we have, we are given H. Um, H is uh, the magnetic field. It's in the X direction. And it's a function of time and z. It's a function of time and z. It has this form cosine omega t minus beta z. And we would like to find the electric field. Okay? Um, this expression cosine omega t minus beta z is, a, is an expression of a traveling wave. And I did explain that before in one video. I'm going to explain it again one more time. So uh, let's talk about, let's write this form again in, uh, in, in, this, in this way. Let's write it as cosine beta z minus omega t it doesn't really make a difference because the cosine is an even function so cosine theta is the same as cosine minus theta okay so now let's talk, let's let's try to plot this function when t is equal to zero if t is equal to zero then this becomes cosine beta z it's a typical cosine but it is with respect to z so we can draw it like this okay it's a cosine function okay and beta determines the, uh, the, the, the separation in space, this separation here, between two beaks. This separation is called the wavelength, and it's simply 2 pi over beta. Okay? 
Beta here plays the same role of omega. When you say cosine omega t, it is the same like say cosine beta z. So again, we say here that uh, the wavelength in time, uh, we, do call it, we don't call it the wavelength, we call it the periodic time. It was going to be uh, 1 over f, and f is simply omega over 2 pi. So beta plays exactly the same role for z that omega plays for t. So if we talk about time t equal to 0, which is this one here, so this is t equal to 0, okay, you see that you have a typical cosine. So keep in mind that this, this axis here is the z axis. So I'm taking a snapshot of the wave at time t equal to 0. Let's now, let's talk about a later time. Let's make t equal to certain time such that uh, omega t equal to pi over 2. Okay, if omega t is equal to pi over 2, this becomes cosine beta z minus pi over 2. We explained in class before when you subtract from the phase, we say cosine omega cosine beta z minus theta, this equivalent to shifting the whole waveform to the right by this angle theta. So if omega t is equal to pi over 2, then the wave is the same as the wave shown here, but it's going to be shifted to the positive z by, uh, a, a, by a distance uh, or by this, the, by this length here, which is by over 2. So I can simply write, draw it again this way. It's going to be something like this. And so on. Okay, so what is happening? As time, as time moves, this wave, so, this wave form time increases this waveform keeps on shifting to the right so it's traveling and we you can use this waveform to send the information if you change its amplitude so if i have here an amplitude i call this amplitude here a if i can change a with time then information will start to travel the amplitude information will start to travel okay if i can change omega also i mean, i can i can send the information i can do modulation and so on. So uh, this is this is really an expression of a wave, not not that different from the wave you receive on your cell phones. And uh, the, the the speed at which this wave moves in free space is huge. It is uh, three ten to the power eight meter per second. Okay, so in free space, this is the speed at which a wave like this would travel. It travels, it travels in a slower way in, uh, in denser media like glass and so on, but in air it is given by this number. Okay, so I just want you to understand that this expression here given, this is a traveling wave. It's a field that's traveling. If you take a look, take a sig like successive snapshots of that field, you see that it's shifting from this waveform to this waveform, and then you can get you can draw even another waveform like this, okay? Again at a later time, and so on. It keeps on shifting, and it's traveling in the positive z direction. If you if you replace negative z by positive z, it becomes a wave traveling in the negative z direction. To it. So it, it, it moves actually in the opposite direction. This is not that hard to show. So now we know the magnetic field, how to get the electric field. We have two, the two curl equations, curl E is equal to minus partial B partial T, and curl H is equal to J plus partial D partial T. No one said anything here about current, so you assume that you are trying to solve for the electric field in a region of the space where there is no current. And no one said anything about the mediums, then we have to assume that it's free space. It is epsilon equal to epsilon naught. The easiest equation to use is the one which has um, partial B partial T. So the easiest one, the easiest one to be able to solve for the electric field is the curl of um, H. I'm sorry, it should be this one here. Curl of H is equal to partial D partial T plus G. Let me tell you why. You, you have the expression of H, okay? Then you can get its curl. And I can simply integrate relative to, to, uh, to time, and then I get D. And D is nothing but epsilon E. The current J is zero. There is no current J here. Because as I said, as long as we are not giving any information about a current in that part of the space, then we can set this part to be equal to zero. 
And one comment I would like to mention about this current, this current here, usually, in general, it has two parts. The first one is sigma E, which is due to the conductivity of the medium in which the wave travels. And the other one, if you have an impressed current, like a current source, and this will be G impressed. So remember always that this J has two parts. One of them is sigma E, when sigma is the conductivity, and the other one is the impressed current. Okay, we'll proceed with the solution. Um, curl H is equal to J plus partial D partial T. J is zero. We assume that we are in a part of a space where there is no current, no information was given about that. So what remains, I have to find the curl of H, and then I'm going to integrate it relative to time to get E. So let's organize things. So D is epsilon E, and we assume it's free space, so I can take it out from the derivative. It's epsilon equal to epsilon naught here. And then I'm going to divide both sides by epsilon to get this one. And I expanded now the curl. Remember that H has only an X component. And this X component is a function of Z and T. Okay? So if you try to find the first component of that curl, you get zero. Try to find the second component, this will give you zero. But this one will be non-zero. Because HX is a function of Z. Let's talk about the third component. This will give you zero, and this will give you zero as well, because hx is not a function of y. So after you expand it, this one gives you a negative sign, but because you say it is the derivative of this minus the derivative of this, you get another negative sign. Negative, ne negative becomes positive. So this is the expression of the curve. Okay? You simply have to differentiate hx red to z in the y direction. You expand hx from the previous slide, as h naught cosine omega t minus beta z, okay? Uh, if you differentiate this derivative to z, the derivative of the cosine is minus sine, and the derivative of the angle will give you minus beta. So minus minus becomes plus. So you get here beta, so we have this beta here, okay? The amplitude h naught is a constant, you take it out, maybe it can 3, 4, and 5. Epsilon is still there, it's epsilon naught, I simply write it as epsilon in general, but it's fine. The cosine becomes a sine. So what I did, I differentiated cosine omega t minus beta z. The derivative of the cosine is minus sine. And the derivative of the term inside the angle will give you minus beta. Minus minus becomes positive. Okay? So um, now, this term here is not, a, is not e. It's partial e partial t. Then you have to integrate e relative to t. So you have to integrate this term relative to t. The integration of sine is minus cosine. And the, integra and the integration of, and because this omega t, you have to divide by omega. Okay? So this is why we have this negative sine, we have this omega, and the sine becomes cosine. And like any integration, when you integrate, you must add a constant field. A constant field that's not a function of time. Remember, you integrated relative to time, then you must add a constant field that's not a function of time. I call it here E static. Okay, I call this one here e-static. But does this e-static really uh, exist? Well, static fields, if it exists, it cannot travel. Okay, and now we are talking about traveling wave. Um, and if it exists, it exists without being correlated to a magnetic field. So in, if, if you are talking about a general part in the space, it is this part only of the traveling wave that is coupled to the H given. So this part will have to be equal to zero, okay? So we can set any static field to be equal to zero here in this case. So organize our solution. I can write the electric field as minus E naught cosine omega T minus beta Z, where this is the amplitude of the electric field. Remember, H naught is given, is a number. Omega is the angular frequency. It's 2 by F, and F is the source of the of the of the uh, tower or or the antenna that created these fields epsilon is equal to epsilon naught so we know it beta is we can calculate beta later in advanced courses you'll know how to calculate beta uh, actually i can simply give you an expression here free space beta is uh, omega naught square root mu eps, mu naught epsilon naught so beta is really the uh, angular frequency i write it as omega naught okay so this is 2 by f, mu naught is the permeability of free space, epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space. These ones can be derived very easily using 
uh, the, the analysis of the wave. It's called wave, equi wave equation analysis, okay? But yeah, so this is beta is known. Everything really is known in this equation. H naught is known, epsilon naught is known, omega is 2 by F. This should be given. And beta is also calculated once you know omega. Now, if you divide divide the amplitude of the electric field and the amplitude of the magnetic field, you'll see this is, if you divide this by this, you get omega epsilon over beta. This is electric field's volt per meter. This is magnetic field ampere per meter. Volt over ampere is, is ohm. And indeed, they call this term here the wave impedance. Okay? And it has units of ohm. Omega epsilon over beta is called the wave, the wave, uh, wave impedance. And if you calculate it for free space, I'm giving you some numbers to try. F is equal to 10 to the power 9 hertz. Then omega is 2 by F. I can calculate that. Take this beta to when you buy over 3, H naught is 3, epsilon is epsilon equal to epsilon naught. Calculate E naught over H naught. You will see that in free space, this number is always 120 pi or 377 ohm. This is called the wave impedance in free space. It's a very well number that all people who work, who work in high frequency applications know very well. And those of you who are going to take advanced courses in electromagnetics will get will understand more the significance of this number. So what's happening here, we have an electric field that's traveling in space, it's traveling with a magnetic field in space, both of them traveling together, they are normal to one another, this is in the minus y direction, the given magnetic field in the plus x direction, and they are both traveling in the positive z direction. And there is a specific ratio between their amplitudes. This ratio is 120 by or 377 ohms. So to summarize, this is what we have. You have a magnetic field in the x direction. You have an electric field in the minus y direction. If you take a cross product between E and H, E cross H, you'll see that it's going to point in the direction of wave propagation. We call this an electromagnetic the pointing vector direction. Okay? So the, both the electric and magnetic field are traveling in space, traveling at, at the speed of light, free space 310 to the power 8 meter per second, orthogonal to one another and orthogonal to the direction of wave propagation.